direction is the vision, the mission is the reason why we're doing this, and then the strategy is really how we get there. How we get there. Strategy, you know, definition, a simplistic definition, um, is the what makes us different, what differentiates us, makes us better competitors in the marketplace of our choice. What makes us better in the marketplace of our choice, what helps us be more competitive, and how can we systematically cultivate that competitive advantage. So in essence, a strategy is a way of creating and sustaining a competitive advantage. Much has been written through history about strategy, anywhere from the art of war, which was written in ancient, ancient times, to more modern texts that have to do with blue ocean and competitive forces and so on. And I want to dwell on a couple of these just because they're kind of interesting. The first one is Michael Porter, the five, the five forces. Uh, anyone remember Porter and his five forces? Michael Porter writes about the nature of marketplaces and the five competitive forces that, that shape, the, shape, shape that industry. And those five forces were The first one is ease of entry. How easy it is to get into this industry. Forgive me, I'm assuming everyone's read Michael Porter. Very boring reading, by the way, so don't worry about it. Um, here's everything you need to know. Uh, the ease of entry into the industry. Uh, how easy it is to enter into the advisory industry? Pretty easy to enter. You don't need a ton of capital. The licensing requirements are not very high. You can register an RIA, you'll get a Series 7 license. Fairly easy. What does that tell you about competition in the, in the advisory marketplace? There probably would be lots. There will probably be lots. Um, then bargaining power of buyers and suppliers. Who are our suppliers? These advisory firms. Well, he's writing about manufacturing firms. Custodians, mutual fund companies. Custodians, mutual fund companies, investment managers, exactly. How much bargaining power do they have? <laughs> well, they're, they're competitive. Uh, quite a bit, quite a bit, quite a bit. Um, Michael Porter makes the point that if your suppliers are consolidated, you're likely that will likely force consolidation downstream as well. If there's one chip manufacturer, then those that are manufacturing computers will probably start consolidating as well. So with custodians perhaps being somewhat consolidated, that will probably facilitate consolidation of the industry as well. And actually, you do see some of those trends as well. Custodians, generally speaking, prefer their larger clients because obviously they're larger relationships, much like you would do. They do client segmentation too, so um, they end up, uh, they prefer to focus a lot of time and attention on large clients, not neglecting small ones, of course, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the, the reality is that in doing so, they actually encourage some of that consolidation too. On the other hand, mutual funds and investment managers are, Consolidation-wise, not so much at all. There's actually more investment managers in the country than there are individual it, it stocks on the, the major stock exchanges. So if we assign one stock to each mutual fund, we're going to run out of stocks before we run out of mutual funds. So that's a very diverse marketplace, so not a lot of, not a lot of pressure on the industry coming from that perspective. The threat of substitutes and rival, the threat of substitutes, how, how vulnerable are we to the substitution effect? Do you, you mean a substitute like a robo-advisor or like another human advisor? All of the above. Anywhere from doing nothing to creating your own spreadsheet to robo-advisors to everything else. How vulnerable are we? Very. Very. What is that likely to do to competition? Pretty, it will probably be pretty intense. Um, Mike Porter also talks about the sense of rivalry. Um, rivalry really means sort of the spirit of competition in the industry. Are we very competitive with each other as a posture, or are we fairly collaborative? Where do we stand on that? <coughs> we are somewhat competitive, but mostly collaborative. Yet, I mean, here we are. Um, actually, in some industries, this will never be possible, bringing people from essentially 30 different firms and putting them in the same room and asking them to collaborate and work together. In a lot of industry, would be absolutely a no-go. In our industry, actually, firms continuously form study groups. Uh, they exchange a lot of information. 
Uh, we spend a lot of time together learning from each other. People very freely actually exchange best practices, teach each other. This is a very collaborative industry, still is, thank you. Um, now, some markets are starting to flare up a little bit. Those of you that are in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a little bit of friction probably popping up there. Chicago that way, New York, the larger metropolitan markets are starting to get a little more intense that way. But generally speaking, this is still a fairly collaborative industry. So as you're thinking about the industry and what's likely to happen with the industry, sort of at the macro level, Michael Porter's five forces actually help quite a bit. The ease of entry, the power of, of suppliers, which are mutual funds, custodians, technology providers as well, the bargaining power of our customers, uh, which is also important for some reason, I skipped to it, the competitive rivalry within the industry, all of those are going to influence the landscape. Make sense? Another kind of more recent text is the Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, and that one speaks to, sort of in pirate terms, if you will, of the red waters, the bloody waters. Remember what they got? <coughs> Anybody read the book? They talk about they talk about some markets being very competitive. And Markets being very competitive, resulting in bloody waters, meaning there's a lot of competition there. Everybody's rushing into that market. Everyone intensely is competing for that customer. And as a result of that, that's a very hostile and very difficult place to be. They contrast that with the blue waters. And blue waters simply meaning that's the place where other people are not. That's the place where there's less competition. That's a way of framing your services or finding the markets that are not so contested. And as a result of that, having better chances for success uh, because you don't have to compete against the big battleships, if you will. Make sense? So you kind of you think about the industry. What are the bloody red waters? Doctors. Doctors. Definitely a lot of competition for them, absolutely. High net worth. High net worth, especially ultra high net worth. Particularly that $100 million investor everyone is dreaming about. Everyone is dreaming about. That is very highly contested territory. Uh, and that really is you know, one of many examples of bloody waters. Because at the end of the day, every market is competitive to a degree. I've always thought that if you have no competition whatsoever, you're either doing something brilliant or something absolutely dumb. Uh, just one or the other. Um, and I know for a fact I'm not brilliant, so, so usually if I find myself without competition, it probably tells me something. But that said, uh, that kind of notion there is that seeking the safety of markets that are not heavily contested and seeking the safety of framing your services in a way that does not expose you to competition or some of that cost. In some ways, if you examine how firms compete in the marketplace, you can probably summarize the competitive strategies or the elements of competitive strategies in the advisory industry along maybe these six dimensions or so. The first one is the, what I would call a famous person strategy. Uh, and I'll clarify that term because famous person doesn't necessarily mean some kind of a rock star that everybody knows. Uh, the second component of that is finding niche markets, that notion of the blue waters. The third possible strategy is uh, service differentiation. In other words, proposing services to clients that others don't have or proposing them in a way that, that is unique to your firm. Product differentiation is also possible, and I'll give you examples of that. Of course, price competition is always available as a strategy, even though that's not a very good one, uh, or at least not a very friendly one. And then distribution methods can also play a role as well, and I'll give you examples and explain all of those. Before I jump into that, though, there's a slide I skipped, and it's an important one. That at the end of the day, the ultimate strategy, the best strategy for a firm, is a process of triangulation or quadrupulation, if there's such a word. There isn't it. Um, what you have to be kind of asking yourself as you look at the strategy of your firm and the case simulation firm is, first of all, what are our core competencies? The notion of what are we good at? What has made us successful today? All of these case studies are successful. Well, every single firm that, that's written up is a firm that has experienced quite a bit of success, financial success, growth, prominence, all of those components are there. So what has made us successful? What is our core competency? The second and very, very important question is what do our clients want? What are their needs? What are their demands? What are their preferences? What are the characteristics that they are looking for when they choose an advisor? So it's our core strength perspective. It's the client perspective. And then the third one is the competitive perspective. 
what is the level of competition we will face, how competitive is that marketplace if we choose to go there, who else is there, how good they are at doing this. And that's kind of the classical triangulation between core competencies, marketplace, and competition. And then the fourth characteristic, which is very important to privately owned firms and relatively small firms as well, is what is our passion? What, what motivates us? What makes us interested in this? Because once again, if we lose that intrinsic motivation, if we lose that sense of purpose, that sense of mission, even the best of strategies will probably not take us very far. And again, careers are long. Uh, developing a business takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort. Inevitably, there comes this moment of doubt where you wonder, should I be doing this personally? Should we be doing this as a farm, as a team? When those moments come, ideally you want to have a strong answer that comes from inside, that people are passionate about this because they believe in it. Um, I promise you that I will talk a little bit about boxing, and through one accident or another, I ended up owning a boxing gym in Seattle, which is why I talk about boxing so much. Um, so I box a little bit, uh, not well, by the way, uh, but I boxed a little bit, and it was kind of one of those breakaway broker kind of things. Um, I was boxing out of a gym, and my coach came to me one day and said, hey, you, you know, you've been joking about being an owner in a boxing gym for a while. Do you want to be one? I was like, well, I was joking, but yeah, okay, then let's talk about it. So it turns out she wanted to leave the gym, take her clients, and open a new gym. And I'm thinking that's exactly a breakaway broker. It's the same as someone leaving a warehouse. Um, so I kind of went to the similar process. And I thought, okay, I know about this, because uh, you know, I know about breakaway brokers, so I can do this. Um, Sounded like an interesting idea, uh, and you know, today, six, seven years later, I have a box in gym in Seattle. So there, here I am. Um, and I can tell you this that I've learned from this experience. First of all, if someone offers you shares in a boxing gym, well, simply say no. no just, just <laughs> that. that's, that's a very easy answer. Just stay away from that. Generally speaking, gyms are a horrible investment. The economics of gym and competition, by the way, of gyms is enormous. If you kind of run the gyms through Michael Porter, you will end up with very, very dismal results. But be that as it may, um, I'm still fascinated by boxing, because uh, it's kind of human behavior in very extreme circumstances. So I was asking my coach, if what motivates a boxer? How do you motivate a boxer? Because she coaches professional boxers, amateur competitors, Olympic level people, and so on. So I was asking her, like, how do you get a boxer to be motivated? And she said, well, you, you can't. It, it really has to come from the inside, because in the middle of a round, about two minutes into it, when this other guy has been hitting you in the head, um, and you're bleeding very often, um, you don't hear any of the voices from the outside. And you forget all of these strategies and all of these things. And all you have is whatever's beside you. And I know this kind of sounds like this kind of metaphysical kind of statement, but in those extreme moments, the only thing that drives you are the things that are very native to you, the things that are kind of very deeply embedded in you. Uh, and the same is true for businesses as well. In moments of crisis, in moments of hard time, like what we saw in 2008, uh, in moments when you lose your top client, in moments when you lose your founders for that matter, um, in the case of Burns Simpson, when your founders suddenly retire, those are the times where whatever comes from the inside kind of comes from the, to the surface. And ideally, the strategy you've chosen is a strategy you want to follow in those extreme circumstances, because if it's not, then teams fall apart. So choosing a strategy very often is a question of what the market gives us and what the competition gives us, but it also should be a choice of what do we inherently believe in? What are the things that keep us together? What are the things that unite us? Once again, going back to the sense of mission. So some examples of strategy, starting with famous person. You probably recognize this face. This is Rick Edelman. If someone calls Edelman Financial, most likely, what drove them to that firm? What made them make that phone call? His radio show, or his books, workshop. his workshops. Many of those marketing methods that ultimately focus on Rick Edelman. Rick is very famous, extremely famous, and a lot of clients call their 1-800 number because they're aware of his fame and they're aware of his reputation. Um, another such example is uh, this gentleman, who also became infamous lately uh, for some of his very smart quotes, or quite the opposite thereof. Um, but Ken Fisher is a similar example of that. Uh, he writes for Culture Magazine, if I'm not mistaken. He has some level of fame, and that fame attracts a lot of clients. Now, those are extreme examples of someone being famous. That said, though, a lot of firms actually have a different version of that. Natalie Cook, for example, over there is a classical example of a professional who's not necessarily famous in like the TV, radio show, publicity, empire, 
but it's certainly famous in the sense of very well known in the local market or very well known in the local community. And that still is the same strategy that ultimately it's a personal reputation, regardless of how it has spread, that causes people to just pick up the phone and call somebody and go to that firm. Make sense? In our firm, we frequently talk about this, that in the early days of the ensemble practice, generally speaking, the phone would ring and people would say something along the lines of, I want to work with Philip. The dream was always, and to this day, the phone rings and we hear something along the lines of, I want to work with somebody from ensemble. And by the way, who's Philip? Um, that would be that transition from a, from a personal reputation to the reputation of a business. Make sense? And for a lot of your cases, that really is the strategy. Right now, the strategy that has made you successful is a personal reputation. It's the reputation of a founder, the reputation of an executive. Someone made that firm, made their name well known. They, it may not be a TV name, but it's still well known. And then the challenge is to transition that into either other people's reputation or a broader group of people. You also have to notice that all of these strategies are inherently different and they have their strengths and weaknesses. Let's go back to Edelman Financial and maybe just kind of take a few stabs at it because it's fun. Um, what are the, but first of all, is this a potentially powerful, successful strategy? Does it have some strengths? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, one of the largest, fastest growing companies in the industry. Whatever you, you may think about Rick or, or the, the services they provide, they're one of the fastest and largest. Um, what are the other strengths of this business? Yeah, please, Frank. Uh, they have a pretty uniform process. It's, so it's a highly repeatable business process from what I can tell from the outside. There's not a lot of variation, um, which means that it's, it, I think it's highly efficient. Very scalable, highly efficient, and their growth methodology is scalable. The more you can grow that reputation, it, it's a reputation that can spread from one market to another relatively easily. Some reputations, like personal reputations, like many of the ones that are written in their cases, you know, Natalie Cook is famous in Carmel, uh, California, which is where that Cook is, uh, but it would be very difficult to transfer that re reputation to, let's say, Salt Lake City. Uh, same is true for Chuck and Harold. I mean, they're, they're kind of well known in San Diego, but it would be very difficult to move that to Seattle if they had to. So, this kind of reputation is actually very scalable, very transportable from one market to another. So, it's a potentially very powerful strategy. On the other hand, it has some issues. What are those issues? Some very obvious ones. Risk. Risk. What's the risk? Dies tomorrow. Or at a yeah, and also says something at a conference. You know who would do that? Uh, normally, that never happens. Um, it, there's a lot of vulnerability associated with being so heavily reliant on one person. What else is a potential issue there? Succession. Succession may be a huge issue. Um, actually, Edelman kind of tried some steps in succession, even identified a successor, then they got into a fight with it. Uh, with, with each other, I forget the name of the identified successor. Customization. Uh, I'm sorry? Client customization. Client customization is not necessarily a, an issue. In their case, because they're a national firm, they really have to standardize. Uh, literally, I believe, I've talked to some advisors that tell me that every Monday they have to take a test to basically answer questions, what did Rick say on Sunday? Because their clients are likely to ask them about the radio show which airs on Sunday. So, so you really have to know the gospel there. Uh, that's not inherent, inherent in the strategy though. There are famous person and firms that can allow for some uh, customization there too. Is it easy working in a firm like this? It may or may not be. I mean, I don't want to be judgmental, but definitely the, the kind of people that occupy this much space on the website, on the front page, tend to have an ego of equal size. Um, so it's not, I mean, it's, in Bulgaria they say that nothing grows under a big tree, um, just, you know, cast such a big shadow. Um, these are big trees. By definition, a firm that's built on the personal charisma, reputation, and skills and talents of one person may experience a hard time replacing that person, and may also, that can be amplified and worsened by the fact that it's very difficult for people to grow under the big tree. This, this, this has the big tree issue. Now, when you go to niche strategies, the strength of niche strategy is the blue ocean concept. The fact that 
you have a market that's not scalably contested, and you know more about that market than anybody else. Probably the best example of that is not, I mean, on the screen we have a great example of that, but we, the Ensemble practice is a great example of that too. We only work with financial advisors. Our entire strategy is focused on the fact that we work with you a very specific market within the market, and we would like to know everything there is to know about advisory firms. On the other hand, if you ask me to consult with a technology firm, for example, I don't even know where to begin. <clears throat> Um, so, so that's kind of some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses of that strategy. The strength is you know a ton about the market and you build your presence and reputation. On the other hand, you may find it hard if for some reason that market dies off, you may find it hard to transition from one market to another. And it does happen. Uh, we had a client in Denver, for example, specializing in working with telecom companies. Because uh, at the time, somebody was there. I even forget the name. Uh, these days, Denver has no telecom. Unfortunately, those were acquired, they left, and if that was your market, goodbye. Um, that, that market left, and, and, and you kind of tie yourself to that ship, and if the ship goes down, you have to go with it. On the other hand, if you pick the right market, and that market is going, it's a very powerful, very strong strategy. Um, RAA only works, as you can tell, with airline pilots. Um, actually, their chief marketing officer was part of this program. She was part of class number three. Uh, so we got to kind of know the firm a little bit. And they're basically saying all of our clients come from two sources, Delta and American Airlines. That's, that's where they draw all of their clients. They were extremely well known in those communities, and it's very easy for them to become known in those communities because that's a very concentrated marketplace. Um, a little bit of a history buff, and uh, there's kind of a story uh, about Julius Caesar uh, the Roman Emperor, and apparently Caesar is riding through his troops through Gaul, present-day France, uh, which he conquered, uh, to spoil the story. And uh, they're riding through a small village. Uh, if you didn't know that, by the way, you know, there's a spoiler for you. But uh, they're riding through a small village, and one of his generals says, uh, you know, Caesar, what a backwards village that is. Who wants to live here? And Caesar says, you know what? I'd rather be first here than second in Rome. Uh, and that's kind of the idea here, is that you want to be the big fish in the small pond. And by reducing the size of the market, you make it easier to deploy your resources, you make it easier to compete, and you acquire some competitive advantages. It's a power strategy with many, many good examples. As we said, Oxygen is one example, as Brendan just told us. And by the way, they're doing some amazing, interesting things with social media. They focus on Generation XY. Uh, RAA focuses on airline pilots. This is Christopher Street Financial. Another group of friends that I've known for many, many years. Um, they are in New York. They focus on gay and lesbian couples. Uh, Jane Hatch and her colleagues are very well known in that community. And as a result of that, you can easily see this is not a very large farm. Uh, they're you know, no larger than maybe three, four, five million in revenue. But notice the level of publicity that they're capable of. They're quoted anywhere from Bloomberg to the Wall Street Journal and everywhere else. Why? Because they have a very specific presence in the market. It's very focused. Anything they do with marketing, and they're very good at growing the firm, is very focused. It's very easy for them to identify where you need to go. Um, actually, a good friend of mine gave me a great example of the power of target markets, and we'll talk about it in the afternoon as well. He said that some, some psychologists did an experiment, because psychologists, that's what they do. They experiment on people all the time. Did an experiment where they asked people, to take 30 seconds and write anything they can think of that is white, that has the color white. And so people are writing down as fast as they can the number of people and the things that they can think of that are white. And then they took a second group, randomly chosen, and said, okay, I, we want you to write as many things as you can that are white, that are, that are in the fridge, very restricted space. You can easily guess who wrote more. You guys, with the fridge. Why? Just once your attention focuses in a very specific place, you start coming up with items a lot more easily than if you focus on the entire universe out there, everything out there. Once you limit the choices, you may actually be able to identify more and better choices rather than if you're thinking about everything, if that makes sense. Which is, that's the power of niche strategies. Once you narrow it down, it becomes easier to think about where do I need to go market? How can I influence clients? How can I attract more clients as well? So, Niche strategies can be very powerful, but they have some weaknesses as well. What are some of the problems with niches? It also can limit the space that you market 
Yeah, it, it is a limitation. You have to purposefully and you have to purposefully limit yourself. If you choose to focus on doctors, you can't really work with dentists. I and definitely not with engineers. Maybe you can cross from doctors to dentists, but you don't want to work with engineers and business owners and things like that. It does have some limitations. Deters prospects that aren't in the niche. Yeah, prospects who are not in your niche, you kind of have to turn them away. And that's psychologically very, very difficult for some advisors to say, no, you know what, we can't help you, we know somebody else who can. <clears throat> You have very concentrated reputation, and unfortunately, for one reason or another, that market dries up, you go down with the share, plus we were discussing. So we have focused all of our reputations and careers and efforts in the advisory industry, so please, guys, stay alive, and uh, please do well, because if you don't, we, we're totally toast. So you go down with the market, and there's another disadvantage that can be very significant in these strategies. How easy it is to recruit people to join your firm. In, depending on your market, it may turn out to be quite difficult, especially if your market is very narrowly defined. When we recruit, we find that we need to find someone, especially for experienced hires, who knows the advisory industry and has experience consulting. And that's, that's a very difficult intersection. So if you specialize in a very specific market, you may find it difficult to find the people you need. And you have to either train people on your own, which is very viable, but it requires patience and resources, uh, or you have to somehow adapt. Yeah, please. How do you guys feel about firms that carry a firm brand and then an individual niche and things like this? So if you had a firm where you had an internal advisor that specialized in this area, but that wasn't necessarily the brand of the whole firm, do you think that's a mistake, or is that something that's a viable approach? Great question. How many niches can you specialize in? As many advisors you have, definitely. That's probably one criteria. If you have more niches than advisors, then probably something went wrong. <laughs> I mean, like if you go to an orthopedic practice, there's the knee guy, there's the ankle guy, there's the shoulder woman. You know, I know I was seeing the knee guy, and then my ankle went bad. He's like, you got to talk to the ankle guy. So that model seems viable. To, to this point. In medicine, that seems viable. Um, so, so, so here's, you know, here's at least where I stand on that. Um, first of all, if the entire business specializes in working with, let's say, financial advisors, uh, but let's say Janky decided she wants to specialize in technology companies, probably the easy answer is, unfortunately, you know, that's the wrong play, airplane for you. Um, that if the entire identity of the business is focused on one market and there's one advisor who's diverging, that probably is not a good idea because that choice of market is probably very deeply embedded in the DNA of the firm. It will be difficult to build a divergent practice and probably it's, it's just not good for the business, it's not good for that individual. On the other hand, there are many examples of a firm that has multiple niches that they serve. Uh, if you can have critical mass, that to me that's the test. If you can have critical mass in every niche, then you can pursue multiple niches. Most items at the time I left was servicing as many as 25 niches. Then again, there's something along the lines of 5,000 CPAs. So you know that means we're throwing at least a couple of hundred CPAs into each and every niche. So if you have the size and resources, you can pursue multiple niches, of course, as long as they are not divergent from each other and somehow clashing with each other, because that could be the case as well. You know, some of these niches are not very compatible with each other, so you want to be careful there. Um, and then kind of the last talk on this is you also want to make sure that um, as you choose personal, as people kind of choose and commit personal specialization, there's no dilution. Um, and in some of your cases, there's kind of this team of, there's niches, but there may be too many niches. We just don't have the time and the people and the resources to, to commit to that. I'm currently working with a client where they pursue six niches. And then when I interview their professionals and I talk about their experience with the niche, I, I've talked to quite a few people that have been assigned to a niche because nobody wanted to be there. Again, the Soviet system of volunteering. And that probably suggests that, like, all right, we, we just still, it may be a great market, but if no one wants to pursue it, we probably don't want to do it. Make sense? Yeah, please. Cool. I was going to say, I think the, the issue that we're dealing with with our group, um, with JPG Wealth Management, just a quick summary yeah. of it, is it's what, four founding partners all coming out of Anderson. All their relationships are with Fortune 500 companies and those CEOs. Um, now time is going by, everyone's ready to retire, both 
the advisors and the clients. And therefore, this, this opportunity, which was sort of a niche, uh, is, is finished. And so I think us thinking about what our strategy is going to be, that's going to be the question. Do we continue in that niche that we're no longer a part of? Or do we take this critical mass and go in a different direction? Very good point. Uh, and the point is that strategies will change. Remember, visions persist, but strategies will change. What was your strategy initially may over time evolve. Um, your partners, your founders, so JBG, four founders, kind of a silo practice. Every partner has a practice and they have a group of clients and they draw most of their income based on the clients that they serve. So it's kind of one business but really four practices within one roof. They are deploying a strategy which I would call probably a little bit of a distribution strategy. Distribution in the sense that there's a business that has existing relationship with clients and is seeking to parlay that relationship with clients into new services. Good examples of that, and they're all over the industry, are accounting firms, starting with Plan Moran over here. Plan Moran has, I believe, in these days about 17 to 18 billion in assets under management, one of the largest firms in the country in terms of wealth management. They also happen to be the eighth or ninth largest accounting firm in the country as well. Accounting firms have excellent relationships with their clients, particularly business owner clients, and they very much believe they have a competitive advantage approaching business owners with well management services because they have the data, the information, and the trust of the client. And if they can just propose account of well management services to that client, they should be tremendously successful. Examples of success exist all over the place. Uh, actually, many. Advisory firms were started out by people who left accounting firms, um, surprisingly many of them. Uh, they're something along the lines of 20% of the partners in the advisory industry actually have a C CPA designation, so there's a lot of former CPAs in the industry. So that connection is very strong and that's kind of the distribution path. We already have the client, we're introducing a new service. Uh, another group of people doing that are also banks. Banks kind of follow the same pattern. They have the banking relationship, they have your checking and savings account. Whoever you're banking with, chances are you're getting occasional emails saying, hey, by the way, are you investing because we don't have your brokerage account? Good example of that are life insurance companies, very similar strategy. And a good example of that also to a degree, and it's kind of a combination of two services, is also ACO. Um, ACO these days owned by Goldman Sachs. How does ACO attract clients? Corporations. Corporations, yeah, they sign a corporate agreement and they sort of pick off, rather than going one executive at a time, they sign the entire corporation, make it part of the executive package. This is also an example of distribution and an example of a sales method. It's just a different way of approaching the client. Make sense? Some issues with the distribution strategy, because some of you have that, that, that problem. Distribution strategies, Promise to be very powerful, kind of the fish in a barrel type of thing. We already have the clients, we just gotta convince them to do something new with us. But what's the problem? Why is it that accounting firms don't dominate the market? <laughs> yeah, it's a very good reason. No, I, I agree. Yeah, accountants. All kinds of accounting jokes, for example, do you know how you can tell an extrovert accountant? They look at your shoes, not theirs. <laughs> that's an extrovert CPA. Hey, anyways, uh, that's a cheap joke. You all develop a day, why not? Um, you're a boxer. Uh, yeah, if you're a boxer, you don't want to punch below the belt. That really is bad. Um, uh, distribution strategies have one inherent issue in them. Uh, the biggest issue is, particularly if an accounting firm struggle with that, is you are an expert in one thing, and clients believe you to be an expert there, but can they also believe that you're an expert in someone else, something else? Your knee guy correctly says that I'm not a shoulder guy, you have to talk to her. Uh, but if your knee guy suddenly says, oh, you know what, I do shoulders too, especially on weekends, uh, <laughs> how much credibility do they have? And accounting firms bump into that because to their clients, people say, it's like, I trust you with taxes, but then all of a sudden in the summer you become an investment person. I don't know if I believe that. Uh, so there's some loss of credibility. Larger firms, to combat that, hire professional wealth managers. They hire advisors who have that credibility, who have the credentials. Unfortunately, though, it turns out it's not so easy to actually transfer the trust in one relationship to a new relationship. If you've ever tried to get a referral out of a CPA, yeah, it's not so easy to do that. Um, actually, in our consulting practice, within an accounting firm, 
for every 10, 12 clients that we earn sort of on the open market, we'll get one referral from our CPA partners. We always had more credibility outside the firm than inside the firm. As they say in Bulgaria, no one's a prophet in their own village. And the accounting firm is kind of your own village, so you see it with more skepticism in there. Uh, it's also an issue of um, recruiting people. Accounting firms are very good at recruiting accountants. If you're not a CPA in an accounting firm, sometimes you feel like the broccoli at a steakhouse. Uh, you're kind of a side dish. Um, like people don't come for you, they come for the steak, and you're kind of on the side. So, so there's a little bit of that recruiting issue. Of, you know, if, you, if you're working in an accounting firm, you kind of have to accept the you know the middle seat on the plane. So. Yeah, maybe, maybe some personal scars revealed there, but that's part of the issue of the strategy as well. I had sort of two questions, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you were talking about the multiple niches. You see that, I can imagine the challenge for a lot of them is, is that if you're going into multiple niches, it can work out like you're saying, but if they, I can see where it wouldn't align with the vision that you have, where you could, that could diverge while you're chasing that shiny object. Do you, do you see that? I, I see it all the time, and I think you gave us the answer as well, is uh, if, you, if you find yourself doing that, then kind of stop. If, if it's divergent from your vision, that's the entire idea of vision, is if it's not part of your vision, then you shouldn't be doing it. Even if it shines, even if it promises to be lucrative, you either have to change your vision, and if you change your vision, you lose credibility with yourself and your team, or you have to simply say, no, that's not for us, we'll do something else. And I was also curious, just looking at the, the Christopher Street mm -hmm. website, you know, they had the, the, the Spondent uh, Democrats Guide to, to the Trump uh, thing. Are you seeing um, Is that, I, I have, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's at the bottom, and I'm yeah. sort of curious, you know, I, we try to avoid that whole political kind of thing, but I mean, I could, what are you seeing? Is it, is it now firms are much more strident in expressing who they are politically and it's a good discussion between you, and I'm not going to just be dodging this one. I think this is kind of one of those things that after you have a couple of drinks tonight, you can talk to each other about it. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's, that's what drinking is for. Um, so yes, some, of, uh, some of this is, uh, yeah, I come kind of from a country where drinking is a national sport. They, they say in Bulgaria that some men drink from sorrow, and some drink from happiness, and some drink from the morning. Um, so, so that's where I'm from. Uh, but some markets imply some political spectrum and some specific views. Depending on who your market is, your market may also make some statements about social positions. Uh, your market may be implying some statements about political positions or so. And some markets may not. I mean, it's very, very dependent and very different from market to market. We had a client, for example, um, that identified their target market with people with uh, RVs and large dogs. Um, that was their target market. It's people who like to vacation in their own RV and have a very large dog. Generally speaking, <laughs> you can probably also guess very quickly that where they stand <coughs> in terms of the Second Amendment and carrying guns. They're probably the same size as the dogs. Uh, so it's, it's, sometimes your market will imply those things, and obviously that also is kind of part of your mission. I mean, if your mission implies something else, then you, you may have to find some tough choices. Hey, what are the tricks? Challenges in, in conversations uh, seems to be that you know if you identify a target market and you know, make socially conservative or socially more progressive, that uh, one of the risks you run into these days is that even if you find someone that is leading in that direction, you may not be orthodox enough for them in terms of being on one side of the political aisle or the other. But you may also find that your clients do not want you to be political. Uh, they, I mean, depending on the market, you may find that some of your clients would rather not listen to you pontificate about your own political beliefs. Yeah, we, 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 but we, you may find in some markets that actually they want you to. Uh, so so we, we, as a matter of fact, we, we don't bring it up, but we are often, especially this year, uh, post with, or, or faced with questions about you know, what, do you, what do you think is going to happen and if this party or that one gets elected, it could be really bad. Yeah, yeah, what can I say? I started my life as a member of the Communist Party, so, you know, I'm going from there. <laughs> Hopefully not returning there. <laughs> it's a very first part. Uh, uh, this is a credit investors in, in Minneapolis, and um, very interesting firm. 
Uh, it's also a very good example of service specialization. So accredited investors, Ross Levin is fairly well known in the industry. He writes some books and articles, wonderful articles as well, by the way. Um, and they're an example of differentiating through the method of service. Uh, obviously, every advisory firm tries to differentiate in terms of service and basically saying we provide great services to clients, we really listen to our clients, but they use life planning and a different approach towards their clients to make that even stronger. They talk about their professionals as financial therapists, literally that's a term that they would use, um, and they talk about a very special connection with their clients that is not just about sort of the financial mechanics of of what's happening with clients, but it really has a lot to do with how clients feel, how they connect with money, what money means to them, and so on and so forth. So when Ross is writing articles, he's writing articles about should you help your children to buy their first home, for example, and those kinds of issues. They have to do more about emotions and relationships than they have to do with finances. Again, a great method of differentiation. And then another good, good example, and something that's very familiar with you, is product differentiation. This is the ability to differentiate based on the specific product that you create. And obviously service is not a product, but also service can be productized. In other words, it can start looking like a product. And also in our investment implementation, we frequently use a variety of, of, um, of products. So this is DFA. So notice three elements of, of the competitive strategy of DFA. The first one is product differentiation. They create very specific type of funds that kind of like index funds, but index funds plus uh, with some very specific characteristics. So it's unique product. The second part of the strategy is a unique distribution approach. You can't directly as a consumer open a DFA account. You have to work with advisor and advisors are carefully selected. So it's a distribution method. And the third element of that has to do with something about famous people. There's quite a few people on the board that have uh, Nobel prices and things like that. So we have a combination of famous people, distribution approach, and unique product. Make sense? And notice how the three combine. Yeah, last but not least, uh, kind of a good example of something else that we don't see a ton in our industry, but still it's present. The Garrett Financial Network. Anybody know those guys? Yeah, please. Oh, you want me to talk? Yeah, yeah, tell, tell us about Garrett Financial Network. Um, so Susan Garrett, mm -hmm. she started a firm where she they do only hourly advice. They do not do investments, but they advise. That's all they do. Exactly. Their differentiation is their pricing method. They only charge hourly fees. They do not do assets under management. They do not do implementation. They only charge hourly fees, which makes them very different than most advisory firms. So a good example of a pricing strategy. The reason I bring it up is because you know it's part of the catalog of strategies, if you will, and also we're hearing a lot these days about changing our methods of pricing. Firms are wondering a lot, should we use fixed pricing, should we use retainers, should we use something else, especially as we work with younger investors, do we need to modify our method of pricing a little bit? I guess what I want you to take from all of these is that Obviously, every strategy of every firm is unique by definition. If you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, it's not differentiated. And I want that to be clear. There are a lot of great things you would do that will not make you better than the competition. They will bring you up to par with the competition. As the Canadians say, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the other guy running from the bear. But the other guy is very often running really fast, and in our industry, it's a competitive industry, the firms you compete with do a lot of great things. Uh, the great things you do are not always differentiating, they may just create parity. So time and again, I talk to firms and they say, well, our differentiator is the fact that we really listen to our clients, we return all of their phone calls, and we provide excellent service. And that's great, and that probably is exactly what creates great client relationships, but the question is, is it differentiating? And the answer is probably no, because everybody else does. Actually, these days, everybody answers their phone calls. Even Merrill Lynch does that, I believe it or not. Uh, so again, remember that many of the great things you do, amazing things that you do, may create nothing else but parity if everybody else is doing it. Make sense? So the next question in your business plan is, having worked on vision, and obviously we only gave you the grand amount of time of 10 minutes to work on your vision, the next big question is going to be, with that vision in mind, what is our strategy? What, is, what will make us different in the marketplace? To answer that question, we're going to need to define what our marketplace is as well. And that's part of the reason why I don't want you to jump into what differentiates us today, because we need to identify a market first. Our competitive advantages exist in the context of a market. 
If you're a basketball player, being really tall is a great competitive advantage. You know, being a seven footer will really differentiate you out there. Unfortunately, though, if you're a gymnast, being a seven footer really means you can't really spin on the bar because you know the bar is just not high enough. So, so the advantage is defined within the context of the market you choose. What may be advantage in one market may be a complete disadvantage in another. Uh, so you have to choose a market first before you choose a strategy. On the other hand, just for the purpose of discussion, from vision to strategy, it's an easy transition, which is why we're presenting them this way. Because in some ways, a vision is a destination, and a strategy is kind of the Google Maps of turn by turn, how do we get there?